Okay, so today we're going to continue our discussion of protection. Uh, and remember, we have our three uh, sort of protection primitives that we've been talking about. Authentication. Uh, authorization. And confidentiality. Today, we're mostly going to focus on authorization and co confidentiality. Remember, we've seen, and we're going to continue to rely on this set of cryptographic primitives. Um, so the cryptographic primitives that we talked about are sign and verify. We said that sign accepts a message and some key, um, and verify accepts the message in some case. Sign accepts a message and a key and outputs uh, some signature. Verify accepts the message uh, and the signature and some other key, K2, and tells us whether or not uh, this, the, tells us whether or not it believes that the message that uh, this M actually corresponds to this signature, right? We talked about how if K1 is equal to K2, uh, this is a shared key system, and if K1 is not equal to K2, we typically call this a public key system. We also talked about our uh, encrypt and decrypt primitives. We said that encrypt accepts some message M and some key K1, and outputs some encoded message, uh, some encoded message C, um, and decrypt takes C and some K2 and gives back M. Okay? And again, we have the same separation between shared key and public key, private key. Okay, so if you remember last time, we were talking about this protocol uh, that was a protocol for doing secure uh, to, for establishing a secure communication channel. So we got as far as talking about how we would uh, actually authenticate a user. We talked about the process for authentication, and then we were using our authentication process to exchange uh, to build up a, a protocol for setting up a secure communication channel. So um, the way this was going to work is that we were going to use, use a public key uh, cryptography. We're going to use our uh, encryption with, with a public key uh, to exchange a shared key. And then we are going to use the shared key to encrypt our communication. Okay, so this was this, and I, we, we went through this example of the Denning, Denning SACO protocol, which I'll quickly review. And remember, I told you that this protocol is broken, and we got as far as not quite figuring out how it was broken. So let's see if we can figure out how it's broken now. Um, so again, we said the idea is Alice first sends a message to Charles. So Charles, remember, in our model, Charles is this certificate authority, the guy who's going to uh, issue, who, who both Alice and Bob know and trust. Um, so Alice says, sends a message to Charles saying, hey, um, I would like to get the, get the certificates for uh, Alice and Bob so that I can establish a secure communication channel. Charles goes ahead and agrees with this and sends a message back, um, which consists of these two certificates, um, one certificate for Alice and one certificate for Bob. Both of these certificates have been signed with Charles's private key. Because they're signed with Charles's private key, that presumably means that only Charles could have possibly gener generated these certificates. Okay? And the contents of these certificates are simply uh, the public keys of A and B. E the, there's two certificates, and each certificate contains the public key of the, uh, the name of the, the principal that the certificate belongs to, the public key of that principal, and then some timestamp, which remember we said we want to use to make sure that these uh, certificates are, are fresh. Okay, and now what happens is that Alice, uh, it's in order to establish this communication uh, with Bob, um, needs to exchange her, needs to send, needs to uh, propose a shared key that she can go ahead and use with Bob. So she, what she does is she sends, um, 
her certificate, which is something that uh, uh, Bob should be able to use that, to validate that she is uh, that she is in fact who she says she is. Um, and remember, she can't forge this because it's signed with Bob, with Charles's uh, private key. Um, and she also goes ahead and sends um, this proposed key. And the way she encodes the proposed key is to uh, sign it with her private key, um, so that Bob knows that it actually came from her. And then she encrypts it with Bob's public key, so that Bob believes that this message, so that only Bob, she, so that only Bob can actually go ahead and decode this message. Okay. So let's think for a minute, and we, we, we started to get towards figuring out what's wrong with this protocol. And the way that we want to get, the, the, the way that we started to talk about was to talk about, well, what properties would we like a protocol like this to have? We said one property we would like is for it to have freshness. And what freshness means is that the protocol shouldn't be susceptible to replay attacks. That is, somebody shouldn't be able to take a message, shouldn't be able to overhear a message um, and then replay it sometime much later in order to sort of cause that message to happen again, right? So even if that person can't actually look inside the contents of the message, they may be able to get something to happen simply by replaying a message. So freshness is, uh, is something we want our protocols to have. And in this case, we're achieving freshness hopefully by including this T, which is a timestamp in the message. As I said last time, getting the timestamps to actually work correctly is something that you have to be careful about. Um, and this, the, this is described in, in section E of the notes. Um, freshness, so the first property is freshness. The second one is appropriateness. Okay, and that just means that this message is in fact uh, for the particular sender, the, the, it, it, uh, applies to the particular sort of context in which the message is being used. So that the message should be sent to the sender, that the first people, who is, people who are receiving the message, for example, are actually the intended recipients of the message. And then the third property we said we want is forward secrecy. And this just means that it's possible to change the key. It will be possible to change, switch to a new set of keys at some time later in time if there's, for example, is a, uh, the, key, the keys get breached. So we have a way of changing the protocol. This protocol that we have also uh, achieves forward secrecy. The problem it has is with appropriateness. And let me, so, let me show you what I mean by this protocol being inappropriate. So once we've, once we've exchanged this KAB, now we can go ahead and Bob and Alice can presumably communicate with each other by encrypting, their me by encrypting messages to one another with this, K this KAB key that they've exchanged. Um, okay, so let's see what the, the problem with this, with this is. So you remember, Alice sends this message three to Bob. Now here's what the issue is. The issue has to do with this, uh, this piece of information that Alice is encrypted and signed. And the problem is that this, this message doesn't have satisfy the appropriateness constraint. In particular, it doesn't have any context about which conversation this message is meant to, uh, this, this uh, key is meant to apply to, okay? So let me show, how you, show you a way in which Bob might exploit this. Suppose Bob sends a message to Charles, um, and what he sends in this, Charles, he, in this message, he says, um, I'm Alice. And I would like to set up a conversation with you. Um, and here is my public key. And here's some bit of information that I've signed using my private key um, that is a key that I would like to use for our conversation. Okay, and now Charles has, so Charles sees this thing and he says, oh yes, Alice signed this with her private key. He can check with the certificate authority and see that in fact it was, uh, this, this, this message was, uh, appears to be authentic. Um, the, Issue, but and now he may go ahead and send a message back to Bob um, that's signed with this KAB. Okay, so Charles has been fooled into thinking that this message is uh, that that Bob is in fact Alice, and has uh, it goes ahead and starts to establish some communication with him. Okay, um, and again, the issue is because this uh, encrypted and signed thing doesn't have any information about uh, what conversation this key is meant to apply to, okay? So Alice hasn't said that this is only a, a key that applies to a conversation between Alice and Bob. So now anybody who overhears this can use this key to establish a conversation uh, it, it, that appears to be originating with Alice that in fact is not. Okay, so let me show you uh, how we go ahead and fix this. So um, this is just exactly the protocol that I showed you before. And the way that we're going to fix this is really, it's pretty much as I've just described. Um, we're going to take this, this big nasty statement that we had here, and we're going to basically move the encryption and sign um, out from around the, 
going to sign and encrypt the whole message instead of simply signing and encrypting uh, this, the one little piece of this message, which was the uh, proposed key. So we're going to sign and encrypt the whole thing together, including Alice's public key, uh, and Alice's certificate. And we're also going to include a sender and receiver in this entire message. Okay, so now we said is we're going to, we, we add A and B as two members of this entire message. And what this allows us to do is to guarantee that uh, because Alice has signed uh, this entire thing, right, Bob isn't able to generate a new uh, version of this thing. Um, or Bob isn't able to use this thing to uh, spoof a conversation with Charles between himself, uh, to spoof a conversation with Charles, okay? So Bob can go ahead and send this thing, can go ahead and send this, uh, it could, could try and send this message to Charles, but Charles could look at this thing and obviously tell that this key uh, was not for a conversation between himself and Alice, but instead was a for a conversation between Bob and Alice, okay? And there's no way that Bob could spoof the generation of this whole thing because he doesn't have Alice's private key, so he couldn't sign this message. Okay, so um, that wraps up most of our discussion, uh, uh, the, the, the extent of the discussion from last time. So what we saw last time basically is a way to set up, to, to do authentication, um, and then at the very end we talked about how we can use authentication to establish the secure communications channel. Um, so establishing a secure communications channel relies on sort of this, uh, the confidentiality piece of this story. I just want to spend a few messages, uh, a, f a few minutes talking about what confidentiality is and how it works. So confidentiality obviously is the uh, the protection of the, the protection of information exchanged between uh, two people or two principals, say Alice and Bob. And the idea is to make it so that somebody who's overhearing this communication wouldn't actually be able to tell what the contents of the message that was overheard were. So the idea is there's suppose Alice generates some message M, puts it into an encryption box, encrypts it with some key K1 generates a new message C, which say gets sent out over the internet to Bob. Um, on the other side, Bob feeds this thing into a decryption box, decrypts it with K2, and gets M out. Okay, and this has the properties that simply knowing C makes it very hard to derive M. Okay, so given C, driving M is very hard to do. That's because of the difficulty of sort of uh, breaking these cryptographic protocols that we talked about in the first couple of times. Um, and that, but that given K2 and C, uh, it is possible to derive M, okay? So the only way that you can do this is by applying some sort of attack on the cryptographic mechanism, hopefully, and uh, this, but this property that given K2 you can derive C, it's relatively easy for the receiver to go ahead and figure out what the, the message is. And just as, and these, since the, we're using these encrypt and decrypt box, obviously like K1 could be equal to K2, in which case we would be using a shared key approach, and that K1 and K2 can be different, in which case we're using public key, like we've talked about. Okay, so, um, what we built up in this, what we did in, in the secure communication channel protocol that we just talked about, um, just go over here. What we did in the secure communication channel that I just talked about was to establish, was to both authenticate and establish confidentiality and, uh, and to, to, to authenticate and then establish confidentiality. So we had both confidentiality and authentication. So at the end of this protocol, Alice and Bob have authenticated with each other, and they have confidentiality because they've exchanged this key, KAB, that they can use to have a private conversation with one another, right? So this is going to be a common thing that we're going to want to be able to do. It's confidentiality plus authentication. Um, and we see that the way that we do that is exactly what we is, is exactly the pattern that we have going on here in this example. You take a message and you sign it, um, and then you encrypt it. So you have your message M. Um, it's signed with some key, which we'll call kconf for confidentiality. Or sorry, it's encrypted with kconf, and then you're going to sign this whole thing with some key kauth, which is your key for authorization. Okay, and it's okay in this case for these two things. These sign and encrypt can be done in either order. I can sign the message and then encrypt it, or encrypt it and then sign it. Works out just fine. 
Um, so this, this pattern is going to be a common one. We're going to oftentimes, when we're building up a secure system, what you want to do is first authenticate. You want to both guarantee that the person you're talking to is the, you, you want to know who the person you're talking to is, um, and you also want the communication with that, that, that person to be secure. We talked at the beginning, when we first started talking about authentication, we talked about a simpler example where you might just want to authenticate, right? So I had the example, you know, suppose that you're, you're purchasing something and you don't care if somebody knows that you purchased it, like we're uh, you know, giving money to save the whales, right? That example, you're giving money to save the whales. You, all you care about is that save the whales can actually authenticate your message, that the message is well formed from the point of view of uh, uh, the, the, the Save the Whales doesn't believe that you're giving them $10,000 instead of $100, and that Save the Whales knows who you are, so you get credit for giving them that money. But you don't actually maybe care whether that message is encrypted. So another common thing you're going to do is just sign a message with K auth. Okay. It's less, it's less common to see other, the, the other thing you might wonder is, well, okay, how often do people just want confidentiality? Just establishing confidentiality is sort of less common. You, you'd see that less frequently. Typically, people want to either do confidentiality and authentication or just authentication. But just confidentiality is a little bit of a weird case because um, having a private conversation with somebody who you don't know, uh, there aren't that many, that many cases where you want it. You could imagine anonymous communication systems, for example, where you'd like to ensure that the other person, you don't actually want the other person to know anything about who you are, but that, that's a little bit of an a, a unusual situation. Okay, so um, this is, these are the kind, of, kind of the two major forms of private communication that we've talked about so far. Um, and we talked about a few little other details that we need. This, this example illustrated a few other little details that we need to make sure that we, uh, we need to take care of. So um, one of them was this freshness constraint. Um, so in this example, uh, we said this is, e.g., the addition of T to this example up here. Okay? So when we add the timestamps, that makes it difficult for somebody to uh, apply a replay attack against us. The other thing that we might want to do is to add this to make sure that, um, so what we're going to do is here we're going to, e.g., we're going to add, so, um, add T to M. Okay, so this is freshness, so this is going to add um, timestamp to M. Okay, now the other thing we might want is some way to um, guarantee appropriateness. And what we're going to do for appropriateness What we need to do to make sure the message is appropriate is we need to add context to the message. So we need to add some information that specifies who, who was originally involved in the, in, in the message. Okay. So, those are the, so uh, these are sort of the, the two major kinds of protection that we have, and uh, we need to make sure that our, our protection, pro our protocols that we use sort of provide these, these kinds of guarantees. Okay. So now what I want to do is to turn, I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about authorization. So we've seen sort of authentication and a bit of confidentiality. I'm going to talk about authorization, but I want to talk about it in the context of an example. So that you guys, um, because you guys know something about authorization techniques. You guys have all seen, for example, passwords for logging into a system. It's not, there's not a big surprise about how passwords work. We, uh, you know, so the way the passwords are, you, there's some list of passwords and when a user tries to log in, the system checks to see if that, uh, the, the the person is in the list, and they typically take the hash of the password that's typed in and check to see if the hash, word, hash of the password is in the password list. Okay? Um, this is described in detail in the text, and we'll go over it a little bit uh, today. But the, uh, what I want to do is sort of talk about, um, talk about how we fit all three of these things, authentication, authorization, and confidentiality, together into one system as we talk about authentication. Okay? So we're going to use an example. Which is the web. So let's suppose that we're in a situation where we've got some browser B communicating with some web server W over a secure communication channel. 
And if you like, you can think of the secure communication channel as having been established by a protocol like the one I've shown here. Um, in practice in the web, the pro there's a common protocol that's used to establish the secure communication channel called SSL, Secure Sockets Layer, okay? Um, so this channel it has been authenticated um, and it's confidential. Um, so it's often it's it's typically the case, for example, that you know there may be and there may be some certificate authority, say for example, which B has B has used to discover keys for W, uh, to discover a private key to use to talk to the web server W. Okay, so there's a question though that we haven't really really got at, which is. Um, How does W know that B is authorized to access? Okay, we hinted at this uh, on the first lecture about security, um, but this is the, the question that we want to try and address today in a little more detail. So. The issue is that once this protocol is established, these two guys have, have exchanged a key with each other, this KAB or KBW, right? And this is a, a, a shared key that these guys can use to uh, exchange, that these guys can communicate with each other. But basically all that W knows about B is that uh, this is still, this is, this is somebody who has this key. This is the same B who initiated this connection with me, right? Um, W may not have actually checked to go ahead and see uh, what it is on the server that, the, uh, uh, what services on WB has access to, right? So W needs to go ahead and figure out what it is that B can, what, what it is that B can access and needs to sort of check all the accesses that B tries to make on W to make sure that uh, it's, it's authorized to do so, okay? So, If you remember back to the very first lecture, we talked about how authentication and authorization work. We sort of said there's two steps, or uh, in this case, we're gonna actually talk about three steps. So we've got three steps, or three, uh, let's call it three authorization functions, okay? And these, these, are the, these functions are actually uh, sort of share, share something in common with authentication um, because we, authenticating and authorizing um, are, are sort of intertwined together. You'll see what I mean. So the first step is we need some rendezvous, okay? So uh, this is, we, when we talk about this, this is the way that uh, two principles exchange, uh, decide, uh, exchange information about, it initially set up this sort of communicate the, the access rights to the, the, the particular service. So this is, for example, you going to your system administrator and telling your system administrator that you would like an account. He creates an account, he creates a home directory for you, and then you have the author of the rights to access any of the files that are in your home directory. Okay, so think of rendezvous as, as setup. Account creation, uh, you know, you log on to amazon.com and create an account, for example. Okay, so then there's some other step um, which is this verification step. Okay, and verification is simply making sure that you're, uh, this, this, when, you, when you reconnect to the system, you're allowed to connect to the things that you want to connect to. Um, and typically, in an authorization system, we talk about this thing. This, is, this, is a, a, this thing is mediating your, your communication with the, uh, with, this, uh, with the web server. So if I log on to Amazon.com and say that I would like to uh, log in as a particular user, this verification step is gonna make sure that I have the appropriate credentials to log on as that user. And the final thing I might wanna do um, is to revoke, right? I might wanna simply remove a user from the system or make it so that the user is no longer a part of the system. Okay, so. There are two common, or <clears throat> two widely sort of used approaches 
for authentication that uh, have different uh, parts of the, uh, sort of do different things at these different steps. So uh, the two approaches are called lists and tickets. So authorization, um, so we've got these two approaches. The first one is we're going to call lists, and the second one is called tickets. Okay. So, and we've got these three steps. So we've got our setup step, we've got our mediation step, and we've got our revocation step. Okay, so lists are something you may be familiar with. A list is, uh, a, list is a fairly common, so one way that we might authorize whether or not a user is, is, is allowed to access a system is to check some list, right, of all the users who are allowed access, and we may check that user's credentials. Okay, so um, you know, for example, if you go to a party and that party is that party is invite that uh, party is invite only and requires you to you know show your MIT ID at the door, then uh, you you show up at the door, you show them your MIT ID, and then that lets you in, and now you've been sort of authorized to access the party. Okay. Um, Another sort of, uh, the, the other approach is a ticket-based approach. So this is um, an approach where instead of having a list of people and checking credentials when those uh, sort of, w whenever the person wants access, instead you have some ticket which lets anybody who has that ticket have access. Okay, so this is a party is invitation only, you get an invitation in the mail, and now anybody who has that invitation can go ahead and go to the party. Okay, so you guys are all familiar with systems that work like that. You know, it's uh, baseball games or uh, carnival games or whatever it is. You know, they all sort of, you get tickets, and you use those tickets to get access to something, and anybody who has those tickets can use them, right? There's no checking of your sort of credentials every time you try and use them. Um, and as we're going to see, and we'll talk about how this works in the web, it's often the case that you use one of these list-based authentication systems to decide who you should ex ex issue tickets to, and then you give a bunch of people tickets, and anybody can do whatever they want with those tickets. Okay, so let's talk about sort of the properties of these things and a little bit about how they work in the context of a computer system. So uh, the setup process in lists is obviously, well, you add someone to a list, okay? Um, so passwords typically are done with list-based systems. The idea is when you add somebody to a password list, you input their name or their user account name and a, a cryptographic hash of the password that they typed in. So usually you want them to type the, the password in in some secure fashion. You put the cryptographic hash of that password there. Um, and then uh, where it, and then in order to mediate, in order to actually verify, for example, that the password is going to be correct, um, you're going to search the list uh, and you're going to verify that the password, that, and you're going to verify that the password that they present, in fact, hashes to the stored hash in the password file. Okay? So you're going to search the list and you're going to also do this sort of check credentials step. Make sure the password is what it was supposed to be. So it's relatively easy then in this environment to revoke somebody's access. You can remove them from list. And in that case, well, they won't be able to use the system anymore. Okay? Tickets. The idea in a ticket-based system is that, well, when you when you uh, you're going to generate a ticket. And usually what that means in a computer system, or the simplest way to generate a ticket in a computer system, is to generate, make a sort of uh, a hard to guess number. Okay, so this is, for example, uh, you take the hash of some information, you, you, uh, you, you, this might be a hash of something, or it might just be a big random number, right? You want it to be something that if somebody picks, a, picks another random number out of thin air, they don't have a very high probability of guessing a number that actually allows them to access the system. Um, but if they do, ha anybody who has this ticket should be able to access the system relatively easily. Okay, so um, tickets, because these, thing, these, these tickets are just, say, for example, a big random number, um, users typically should feel free to share these, might, might be able to exchange these tickets with each other, right? They should be able to share them with other people um, and, and use them for access. Whereas users typically are not going to share their passwords with other people. Um, so tickets are a way that a user can hand off sort of the authority, the, 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 the right to access a system to some other user. They can delegate. Okay, so now uh, to, to mediate, well, we're just going to um, look up, this is just going to be a table lookup. 
Okay? Um, so we just need to make sure that this is a valid number that was in fact given to us. And typically we don't have to go and check the credentials. Right? We don't have, the user doesn't have to supply a password when they uh, supply us with the ticket. Okay, and then finally, um, in order to revoke, well, we might be able to invalidate a ticket. Um, but invalidation, so you might be able to say, for example, remove it from this table. But invalidation actually, so that, that works fine if we're okay with getting rid of an entire ticket. Okay, but um, suppose, for example, that I want to revoke the right of a single user to access the system. Okay, that's very hard to do in a ticket-based system because so suppose that you guys decide that you know you no longer want me looking at some uh, discussion board about 6033 that you've set up, right? And suppose because you're writing bad things about me and you say, well, we don't want the professor to be able to access this anymore. So you try and revoke my access. If you've been using a ticket-based system, that's going to be very hard unless you invalidate that ticket. And, and there are many people who are sharing the same ticket, that's going to be hard to just deny me access because you're going to have to revoke that ticket and then go to everybody else who might be sharing that ticket and issue them a new one, right? Um, whereas in the password, in this sort of list-based system, you could have just removed my account, okay? And this has an analogy in the real world, um, which is, uh, say, for example, if you, uh, you know, if you have a sort of door locks are sort of like a ticket or like a ticket based system, right? So you generate a physical key for something. You could give that out to many people and then many people can have access to your house. The problem is if you want to revoke access to a single person, then you have to uh, sort of go and collect, either collect the keys from everybody, which may not be feasible, or change the door locks, which denies everybody access until you reissue the keys to the people who need them, okay? So this is, uh, you can, if you like, you can think of a ticket-based system sort of like being door locks in a house. Okay, so let's, um, so there's, to these systems, lists, in, oftentimes the lists are uh, sometimes more formally are called ACLs or access control lists. So you'll see these, you'll see this term used in the text, in fact, as well. Um, and tickets are sometimes called uh, capabilities, okay? So capabilities are sort of these, the right to access some resource on the computer that can be delegated from one user to the other, or one principal to the other. Um, and in practice, what we see both, as I said, in the real world and in computer systems is that we're often going to use these list-based mechanisms to generate, uh, to, to, to decide who to hand tickets out to. Right, so uh, you know, in the in the in the case of you know, okay, who are we going to invite to our party? Who are we going to send invitations to in the mail? Well, you might have some list that you go ahead and assemble uh, based on either people who you know to be MIT students or you know people who meet some particular set of eligibility criteria. That's the sort of process of checking the list, and then once you've assembled the list, you're going to generate these tickets and send them out, and then anybody can use those tickets. Okay. Um, Okay, so this, this same analogy sort of holds true uh, in, the, in the internet. So let's, let's look at how we might uh, build up an, an authorization system on top of our, uh, sec our secure channel between our browser and our uh, web server. So we've got our B talking over our secure channel to our web server. And the idea is going to be as, as follows. So this web server has some, uh, some service that the user wants to try and access. And we're going to have this guard. Remember, we talked about this the guard model before. There's going to be some guard that sits in front of this service that's in charge of authorizing the, the, the authorizing B to access this service. Okay, and then there's some uh, some authorization module that runs on B. Okay, so the idea is that uh, B is going to initiate a, a connection, and then guard is going to send a message to B to the authorization module on B, saying, "Well, who are you?" What are your credentials to access this system? So this is going to be a form. This is going to be a form of list-based access. Okay. So um, now this module on B is going to send a, go ahead and send a message back that says, "My name is uh, my name is what, whatever my name is name, and as well as some key, some credential, like say for example a password." that allows them to go, that, that is, is their password for accessing the system. Um, notice that these two guys may not need to worry about uh, the, don't, don't need to worry about this sort of 
the protect, protecting this channel as far as the rest of the internet is already concerned because they've already established this secure channel of, upon which they can do this exchange of information. Okay, so they're not worried about other people, hopefully not worried about other people overhearing this message. They may not need to protect this information that's being transmitted in the same way, right? Because they've already got the secure, secure communication channel that they've established at the lower levels of this thing. So all of this communication is going over this secure communication channel between these two guys. So this is a layer that's built on top of this secure communication layer. Okay, so now what happens is that what the guard is going to do is he's going to look up this name and password, say for example, in some access control list and use that to determine whether or not this person has the rights to access and what they have the rights to access to, right? And he's going to generate for this person a set of tickets which represent the sort of services that this person can access on this system. So he's going to have some table of tickets and this table is going to have things, uh, is going to have the ticket number and the resource, for example, that the user is allowed to access. So he's going to send back this, some ticket number, call it auth no, back to the user. So we're going to add auth no, and then maybe this is, gives him the right to access some account, so B, B's account information. Okay, so now with this authorization information, this is the ticket. Now, every time that B wants to go ahead and access some, you know, his account, for example, he can, um, he can read account B, and then he just passes the ticket. Okay, and he can use this ticket over and over and over again to access the account um, for as long as the ticket is valid. So oftentimes tickets will have some uh, there'll be a timeout associated with, with tickets. Um, but as long as the ticket is valid, he can go ahead and su supply this ticket in order to be able to access the, the resource that the ticket gives him access to. And he doesn't have to sort of re-authenticate uh, re himself, doesn't have to represent his credentials every time he wants to access this resource on uh, this, his account on the web server. Okay, so um, are the HKN people here? Yes, okay, so we need to do HKN. Why don't you just give me a, one more minute to wrap up and then um, we, can, we can go ahead and do the, do the HKN reviews. So uh, on the internet, this works, the, this protocol of exchanging between the, so the, I mentioned that this is sort of like SSL, or that SSL works in sort of this way. So on the internet, you may have heard about, you may have heard about cookies on the internet. So a cookie on the internet, or on the, on the web, is essentially a kind of a ticket. So the idea with most cookie-based systems is you log in with a password, and then when you log in with that password, the system issues you a cookie. And then when you want to re-access the system, you simply supply the cookie. Okay, so if you, look at the, if you were to look at the contents of a prototypical cookie, it would typically have something like, uh, it might have, say, for example, the user's name and some timeout, a valid period for the cookie, as well as a hash of the user's name, that timeout, and some, say for example, random number, okay, which is only known over here at the service. So the, the service is gonna protect this random number and it's gonna hash it together with the user's ID and this timeout. And so now when this cookie is supplied, it's gonna be hard for, the, it's gonna be hard for users to generate fake cookies, and these cookie, but these cookies are going to allow the user to go ahead and access these services on W without having to re-authenticate every time. And you can in fact, in, in some cookie systems, you can share those cookies. You could copy the cookie from one browser to another and you might be able to reuse the brow that cookie to access the system for as long as the cookie is valid. Cookies typically time out after an hour or two and so then you would have to re-authenticate with the system. Um, Okay, so that's, that's all I wanted to really say about, uh, auth uh, about authentication. Um, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about some sort of uh, advanced protocols um, next time. I want to remind you guys that class uh, is, there is no class on this Wednesday, so don't come here. Um, so the next class is next Monday. Um, and that's it. So good luck finishing your DP2. Um, have fun doing HCAN reviews.